Good morning, folks. Welcome to another Thursday morning practice. Let's get started with the first third. And go ahead. Let's just do that again. That felt nice. I'd like to do another one. And go ahead.
Great. So it's funny having these video classes um, because part of what we get to do is practice along with ourselves, um, which we don't get to do in regular classes. We're used to trading off who teaches the class. So I'm used to practicing in Beth's classes and she's presumably used to practicing in the classes that I'm leading. Um, but I never get to practice in the class that I lead because I'm leading it and Beth never gets to practice in a class that she leads because she's leading it. And so a funny thing about doing these videos is that we get to do it along with the video than when we premiere it. Um, and so that's, that's actually been really interesting to do. Okay, I'm back. Um, I had to cut that because it's really smoky out today from the wildfires and I needed to get a drink. Um, but I was saying, uh, we don't get to take our own classes. And so it's interesting doing these video classes because you're m missing some of the cues that you would have in class. You know, if I'm working in class and I'm facing this way, even though the teacher is over there at my side, I still have other students in front of me. And so I'm still able to keep with it. So, you know, in video, all you've got is the screen and yourself, which is a kind of great pared down, sparse approach, um, but go ahead and let it be a little bit challenging. Look over your shoulder at the screen, you know, do whatever you need um, as you're working through this. So um, we got a question um, and we've been working a lot in these last weeks on how do you actually get all of the motions to come from turning the waist, rooting the feet, issued through the legs, directed by the waist, all that stuff. How do you actually get every single thing that you're doing in the form to be that way? And so it's relatively straightforward. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's straightforward to do something like the white crane into brush knee and feel like you're moving the hands completely with the waist. And so do that with me. Um, we'll face the direction we faced. I faced that way so you could see my hands. Um, but start out in the white crane. When we start just from scratch like this, don't worry about, um, gosh, this is a day of interruptions. We'll see if the dog calms back down. Um, don't worry about your back foot being at 90 degrees. Go ahead and let it be at a corner when you start like this. It's an artifact of the form that we came from shoulder strike that it's at 90 degrees. And so now turn, turn your waist and let the arms swing and turn the waist back towards the front corner as the hands fold over in the footsteps and shift and square. And back to white crane. Make sure the waist is turning all the way through here. Turn, the arms are dropping, the waist keeps turning. Turn back towards the front corner as the hands fold in the footsteps and turn as you shift into the final posture. And once more, back to white crane. Let the hand drop. Turn the waist, turning all the way, turning back towards the front corner as the hands fold in the footsteps and shift and turn into the final posture. So doing white crane there, you've got a lot of waist turn and you've got a lot of arm motion. So it's straightforward to keep them synchronized, right? As the hand drops and I'm turning, I'm continuing to turn all the way here. And now I'm turning back as the hand folds over. So things that happen to people are their waist stops and the arms just keep moving and then they fold over. Now I'm making that really obvious, right? You can just absolutely see that my waist stops, the arms keep moving, the arms fold over. And so at home, of course, you're thinking, well, there's no way I would do that. I turn my waist. So that's great. Um, I invite you to look carefully at what you're doing and see if there isn't a little bit of a stop when you do that. Really, the waist keeps turning all the way here and then comes back. So do this with me again and check if your waist is really turning all of the way. So from white crane, let the hand drop and turn the waist. It keeps turning all the way as the arms swing up. 
And now it turns back towards the front corner as the hands fold and the foot steps. You're in the corner and then you turn as you come into the final posture. And do that again. White crane. The waist turns as the hands drop and as they swing, continuing to turn. The waist turns back to the front corner as the hands fold and the foot steps, turning all the way. And the waist turns as you square. So you can get something like that because there's a lot of motion. But then how do you do these little motions? How do you do the left hand in rollback that as you sit back, the hand turns over? How do you make that actually something legitimately driven by the waist? And so this is, this takes time. And we're told that one of the uh, things that Professor Chung said all the time was, Mon, mon, gradually, gradually, take it easy, give yourself the time. So this takes time, but you need to keep working at it. So just as doing this, you want to make sure the waist is turning all the way. When you're doing roll back, you want to make sure that that hand is exactly moving with the waist. So as you do this, the first thing you have to do is you have to coordinate the changes in the body, even the really tiny changes, a hand turning over with the waist moving. And that's going to be a fundamentally external forced activity. And you have to just do it. Just like when you were learning the form and we said, put your foot here and you put your foot there and that's external. If you don't put your foot in the right place for going into a 70-30, then it doesn't matter how long you practice. You're not going to place that foot and shift and turn internally. You, you just, it's just not available if it's not there. So you have to start out by coordinating the movement. And coordinating the movement, go ahead and look at things like white crane and make sure that the waist is continuing to turn all the way there. Be really demanding on yourself. Don't let the waist stop partway and you keep moving the hands while pretending you're not moving the hands. Be really demanding on yourself that the waist must be changing. When the waist stops, the hands stop. So I've got a couple places I like to do this. We'll do them for a few minutes and then I'll turn it over to Beth who will uh, work on this in one of the more challenging parts of the form. So the first one is at the end of the first third. Num, you know, when we do this whole thing, num, and we cross hands. And if we were going to finish, we stand up. So, you know, I like to do this standing up and sitting down. So start with the feet parallel, toes in a line. And what you're going to do um, is, and you could face it 90 degrees. I think that's a little bit easier for, um, as you start out on the opening posture and sit down and let the hands cross and stand up and let the hands drop. Coordinate this perfectly. When you start sitting, the hands start moving. And the hands finish crossing exactly as you reach bottom. When you stand up, the hands drop all the way, finishing exactly when you reach the top. Sitting down, feel your elbows weighted. Feel the hands moving. Stand up. The hands start moving as soon as you start standing up. Finish when you're at the top. Once more, sitting down. Everything coordinates together. Standing up. Everything coordinates together. So take a break. So it's really important when you're doing this that as soon as you start sitting down, the hands start moving. So don't let yourself start sitting down and then remember the hands, or go ahead. I mean, that's what will happen. And while you're doing this, you will start sitting down without remembering to move the hands. And so notice it. You really want this. Everything starts together. Everything starts together. And then everything has to finish together. So you need to know how far you're going to be able to sit down. That's how much space you've got. And the hands need to go from here to here. And they need to do it in exactly the time that it takes you to sit down. Now, sitting down, you have to sit down straight. So when I'm sitting down here, I just sit down and my torso stays upright. 
there's a real tendency when doing this to sit down for a little bit and then bend over. And so you see, watch that again and, you know, in a non-judgmental, non-personal way, watch my butt. <laughs> and so as I go down, the butt keeps sinking all the way down. A lot of times what happens is you reach a bottom and now watch my butt here. It actually rises as I do this. And you can see my knees are actually straightening as I do that. So be really careful that you're not doing that. When you're squatting down like this, you just sit down. And when you're standing up, you just stand up. It's not sit down part way, bend over. And this may make your hips bend more than you think they will. The hips have to be changing while the hands are moving. So the hands start at exactly the same time as the hips and the hands finish when the hips finish. So it's not that I sit down a little bit and then I move my hands the rest of the way. Same thing standing up. When I stand up, as soon as I start standing up, the hands start moving and the hands finish exactly when I get up to the top. Not sit down, move the hands, stand up, move the hands. Or move the hands, sit down, move the hands, stand up. Now again, I'm making that big. You're unlikely to do it that big, but you're really likely to do it just a little bit. So let's do this a little bit more. Feet parallel, toes in a line, shoulder wide. Start the, do the very beginning. Sit down and the hands start to move. And just stand back up. Sit down and the hands start to move. And just stand back up. Sit down and do it all the way. The hands moving all the way as you sit down. Stand up. Make sure that exactly as you finish standing up, the hands arrive. The hands don't arrive early, they don't arrive late. Again, sitting down. Everything starts together, everything finishes together. You didn't stick your butt out. Stand up, the hands drop. Everything arrives exactly as you get to the top. Again, sitting down. Standing up all moving together a couple more times and one more time Perfectly coordinated. Everything starts together. Everything finishes together. Everything starts together. Everything finishes together. So I love this one because it's simple, right? You're just squatting, you're just crossing your hands. Um, and it gives you the space to really try to coordinate those. Our teacher Jane used to do this with us all the time and it would drive people crazy because I want to do the really cool things. <laughs> I want to be on to the big stuff and you're just making us do this and cross our hands. But it's great because it really lets you coordinate those. You have to do the coordination. And as I said at the beginning, that's a little external. You're making your hands match what's going on in your legs. You're metering out the motion in the legs to match the hands. You're metering out the motion in the hands to match the legs. And so you have to make this work right. You have to coordinate them. And what that does with time is it starts to let you get close enough that you can make it be driven by the action in the waist and the legs. When it's far apart, it doesn't matter what you do in the waist and the legs, it's not gonna move the hands. If you can get the hands into the space where they would be if everything had worked right, then when you use the waist and the legs, you can have a chance of actually having that cause the hands moving. So you have to do this metering work. 
As you do the metering work, with time, you'll start to get a feeling like there's gears. And there's gears interlocking. So if I have two gears, pretend my hands are gears, and they're not connected, they're not engaged with each other, if one of them turns, it doesn't do anything to the other one. What I have to do is I have to get them engaged, and then when one of them turns, it can turn the other one. And so that's the way gears work, right? You pull them apart and you turn one gear, nothing at all happens to the other. They're, you put them together so they're engaged and then they'll turn together. That's, that's what engaging gears is about. That's what, you know, if you have a stick shift in your car, what you're doing is engaging and disengaging so that you can actually change gears. You can bring different gears into play so that the whole thing works. So this coordinating, this forcing the hands and waist and legs to match each other, to be coordinated, is what you do to bring the gears together so that you can have it start turning. So you have to start with the coordination. And then what you want to do is keep working that until you get this feeling of inevitability so that if the waist changes, the hands have to change because the gears are right there. If one gear turns, the other one has to turn too. So as that happens, the hands have to change. That will arise over time. There's an exercise that we were taught by Lindsay Williams, uh, one of Ben Lowe's top students, um, a long time ago. Um, and well, I want to do this with you right now. We call it continuous ward off. It's a little bit like a combination between ward off and cloud hands. And I find it really useful in terms of getting this feeling of gears and in coordinating the motions. So take ward off left. Um, and uh, I don't know what the right way to face is. <laughs> yeah. Um, take ward off left. So good old ward off left, left leg forward, left hand high, right hand at the side. Put more weight forward. And as you do that, turn towards the outer front corner and get a ball of air. So just come back to ward off left. And do that again. More weight forward, turn towards the outer corner. You have a ball of air exactly when you get to the corner. So you're coordinating this. You've got a small turn of the waist. You've got a lot of motion of the hands and those need to exactly match. So again, word off left, turn towards the outer front corner, ball of air. Now sit back and as you sit back, let the two hands change and turn all the way towards the back rear corner. Exactly as you get there, you have a ball of air. And then it's just go back into ward off left. So do it again. Continue towards the front corner, ball of air in the corner. Sit back and turn towards the rear corner, ball of air exactly as you get to the rear corner. And then shift back forward into the 70-30. So you can loop this. Loop it with me. So the reason it's kind of like cloud hands is because of the ball of airs in the side, the balls of air in the side. And it's like ward off because you go through ward off. And so get this coordinated exactly, exactly as you reach 100% back and the rear corner, the hands have turned to be a ball of air exactly as you reach the 70-30 in the front, you've got ward off. Exactly as you reach the front corner, you've got like 80-20 in the legs, you've got a ball of air. So you've got three really important checkpoints. The rear corner, a ball of air with the back, the arm that goes with the back leg on top. The 70-30, where you've got ward off left, where the arm that goes with the front leg is in ward off and the front corner where you've got more than 70 30 a ball of air so three checkpoints that you need to hit exactly by metering and come back to the word off And do it on the other side. So this is where it gets weird. So right foot forward, ward off left on the right side, not ward off right, ward off left. Turn towards your outer front corner, 
have that turn the hands over a ball of air. Come back to ward off left, right side. Turn towards your outer front corner, the hands turn, you get a ball of air exactly when you reach the corner. Again, ward off left, right side. Turn towards the outer corner, ball of air. Sit back, the hands change. Turn towards the rear corner exactly as you get 100% back, a ball of air. And come forward into ward off just as you get to the 70-30, ward off left, right side. Ball of air in the front corner, sitting back, turning. Ball of air in the rear corner, coming forward into ward off. Ball of uh, ward off, 70%. Continue, 80-20, ball of air in the front corner. Sit back, hands change. 100% in the back, ball of air in the rear corner. Forward. Exactly hit the 70-30, final posture, continue, ball of air in the front corner. And back to ward off. Okay, so that's the outline of the exercise. And what this exercise does is it actually helps you find the gears. And so in order to do that, don't let the gears be stripped or disengaged. And what that means is your arms and hands need to be changing at all times. There's a real tendency to carry the arms. So as I do this, I'll come forward and I'll turn. See how my arms are just being carried with me? They're not changing. They're just being carried with me. And then I'll turn them over to get to the ball of air. So no, you need to have them turning all the time here. If you've got your gears engaged, when one turns, so does the other. So if the gears and the hips and the shoulders are engaged, when I turn my waist, both of my hands are going to change. And then sitting back, the hands need to change here. And now especially watch the upper arm. There's a tendency to just turn and carry the upper arm with you. You saw that didn't change. So as I sit back here, my upper arm needs to be changing and rotating all of the way. So the arms are changing at every instant, never carried, because my gears are engaged. And everything works out so that exactly as I arrive, everything is there together. So I'm going to do this for a couple more minutes on each side. I'm not gonna talk, but you need to take this exercise and practice it. Um, it's only through diligent practice, really demanding that you hit the checkpoints exactly and that the arms are never carried, they're always changing, that you'll find the interlocking gears. So you're trying to, the bringing, coordinating it and making it work is engaging the gears then you've got a chance of finding how the teeth actually fit and make it go. So as long, if one of the gears is stripped, then it can be turning all it wants and it won't change the other one. So when you carry an arm, that's a stripped gear. When I carry an arm, this whole gear here is stripped. So it's not engaging. So you wanna get that. So let's do it again for a couple seconds on each side and then I'll turn it over to Beth. So, ward off left, left side, and go ahead. Arms are changing all the way through it. Start by making it work. And through infinite repetition, you will discover the inevitability, the way that there's no choice because the gears are engaged. Hit the checkpoints exactly, the 70-30, the front corner, the rear corner. Hitting the checkpoints exactly. Then check that the arms are really changing all the way through there. No carrying of them. 
Carrying the arms means stripped gears. And back to the 70-30. And hold it there a second. Ward off left, right side. Right foot forward, right hand high, left hand by your hip on the head of the small child. Checkpoints towards the front corner, ball of air, 80-20. Sit back and turn. Rear corner, 100% ball of air. Hit the 70-30 ward off position exactly. So get the checkpoints. Perfectly. And engage the gears. So the hands are changing at every instant. Never carried. And no gears are stripped. Hands change constantly. And back to the 70-30. Hold it for a second. Great. Okay, so, um, you know, Chinese martial arts and Tai Chi and all that stuff is filled with secrets. Yeah. And the secrets are not, uh, here's a principle that you've never heard of before, and when I tell you that principle, it'll change your life. Um, or here's a drill that you've never seen before, and when I give you that drill, it'll change your life. The secrets are the way that the drills connect to the specific skills and the principles. And that's the thing that often people won't tell you. Um, I understand part of why people keep secrets, and one of them is to fill the rice bowl and uh, keep making money. And so that's, uh, you know, it's a valid reason everybody's got to you know, earn a living. Um, another, which I think is actually more important, is that um, they can be misleading if you don't have direct instruction. And so that's why we, you know, really try to work with the stuff that we have, which is not all of it, but the stuff that we have with our students and give them direct instruction. Um, uh, we don't quite have that now because here we are on video. Um, so the, the key idea is the specific exercise or thing to explore that can help you find a skill or a principle. That's the connection that is often missing. And that's something that we're really trying to give you here. So if this doesn't happen automatically. Now you've spent seven minutes doing this drill. And that's like one ten thousandth of the time you need to spend on it. So go ahead and do this drill 10,000 times Pay attention to what I talked about of hitting the checkpoints exactly, having the arms always changing so there's no carrying. And what that'll start to get you is this feeling of gears. And that will answer, how does this hand turn over there, driven by the waist? So this is worth exploring. And here's Beth. So I wanna look at this in four corners. Jane would always tell us that four corners was a great place to look at the saying, Hands don't move, hands never stop moving. So let's do four corners once and become aware of how much the arms are constantly changing. So from single whip. And begin.
rest your legs. So when you first learn this move, it probably has more of a um, feel of something like this, where you're just trying to keep your arms in front of your body, but you see how I didn't really change. So always there's a little bit of change. Hands don't move, hands never stop moving. We once had the opportunity to work with Ed Young. Long, long time ago, we were still, you know, we'd learned the whole form, but we were very much still beginners. And the one thing he worked on with us was four corners. And the thing he worked on with us in four corners was exactly this, keeping the arms moving all the time. And the thing he turned us on to that I've spent all these years looking at and looking for is how the arms actually change as you're stepping to take the corner. So, um, for example, Ta-da! <laughs> Going from corner number two to corner number three. Um, but all over the place, when you're going to step for As I'm coming in here, these hands are moving toward a ball of air. They settle into the ball of air here. When I step, I don't just hold on to a ball and try to keep it as I reach for the difficult place and then start moving again when I'm ready to shift. All through there, there's a, the ball can have a little give. So I start turning and as this leg is coming out, my arm is still moving a little bit. It's not just holding it like this. The ball can do this. The ball can do this. It can change. So this moment here, when I start to step, it moves this hand a little bit. So that's just a tiny little place. But if you, um, and I know this is a hard move to ratchet in, but let's do, um, just go from corner one to corner two, then we'll look at corner two to corner three, how the arms move. But um, if you start yourself in corner number one, so your left foot's forward, as you sit into your back leg, your right hand is dropping palm down, your left arm is also giving. You can stop. And at each moment, your hands are changing with you. And then get yourself lined up, facing the wall, hands in a ball, and we're gonna to go to the big step corner. Begin as you start moving, your hands are also moving. So of course, we don't really do this ratchety thing. That's not how Tai Chi works, but it's a good practice to stop at little points along the way and see if everything has both changed in response to what you're doing and stayed with you, not gotten out of, um, out of whack. So I could start moving and do this and now I'm a little bit out of whack. And anything else that I do, I've kind of twisted up here right off the bat. So um, knowing that I'm keeping 
myself with my hands in, in my realm here is part of what makes this ratchet idea um, useful as a practice. It's almost like if you ever played the statues game, you know, it's like if I yell freeze at any moment in your process of moving, everything should still be together. And in the next moment, everything should have changed a little bit. It's not just held until you get to the place where now you make a big sudden change. So let's do that from corner one, get ourselves to here, and then we'll do it going into corner number two. And maybe we'll take like thirds where we stop and just make sure that the hands are with the body, the body is lined up, and that the hands are in a slightly different place than they were the last time you stopped. Okay, and begin. So here's one place. Next place. Next place. Come to the wall. Fix your foot. Get yourself lined up. Hands are in a ball. And now we'll do thirds to get ourselves over to the next corner. Stop and continue and next one and complete the move. Rest your legs. It can be easy to forget about that bottom hand as you're doing this step. Nothing changed there. Let it change. It's not that I'm busy doing something to it. Now I've pulled my arm apart. This isn't where I want to go. So you just want to look for what's authentic, but it keeps moving. It doesn't just freeze while everything else tries to reposition itself. So it's a sense that as you're stepping, everything is relating but changing. Let's do four corners again, and when we get to corner number two, watch what your hands do getting into number three, and then we can play with that a little bit. <laughs> the day of interruptions, now the phone is ringing. Okay, so you're in single whip and begin. First corner. Hands don't move, hands never stop moving. Watch your hands here. How do they follow? body. And now this should be like what we were just doing, going between one and two. You have a ball of air. Hands don't move, hands never stop moving. So going from number two to number three, 
Get yourself in corner number two. Let's see. Uh, yeah, face this way. Okay, and you sit into the back leg. Arms relax. Step. Arms change. Shift. Ball of air. Moving on. So do it again from two to three. Elbows drop, hands come in, step. Moving into the ball of air, step. Left foot and left arm have a little bit of a relationship where they're changing to balance what's happening. And do it again. It's hard to talk about what the arms do because if I start telling you this or that, then you're gonna make things happen. I want you to find a natural way that your arms keep moving. You can see we're facing the camera. You can see what our arms are doing. I don't know that we're in lockstep of exactly here or there, but they need to keep moving as a direct result of what you're doing. So do it again and just pay good attention to what it is your arms are doing. And begin. So here's a couple of things that I see happening. Where were we? Yeah. <laughs> so elbows relax. They come toward the body. It's like my left hand has a relationship to the right elbow. It's a little like um, lifting hands. Then as you pick up this foot and reposition it, there's a little bit of a outwardy thing going on. The arms change a little bit. So you're not just holding them. They let go. They come into a hand to elbow relationship. Turn, there's a little bit of an extension I shift, ball of air. As I step, it's like the ball starts rotating. As I shift, the ball comes up. And completing the move, ball goes away. So it's not that you're going to places. It's not that you're But find a way that there's natural motion going on all through your, your changes. Let's do four corners again. Now we've kind of looked at some of the slices that you might take out of the um, movement and seen how the hands might change in a natural way. Now let's do it and see if you can't find that happening naturally. So from single whip. Begin. Hands 
and settle into a ball, things start changing. Right hand palm down. It's got to be palm up by the time you come around here. And keep this ball alive. Left hand relates to right elbow. Take a step. Ball of air. Ball is changing. Comes up. Goes away. Settle into the ball of air. Watch how it plays out as you move through the sequence. So there's a lot going on there. Like Lee said, explore it, explore it, explore it. But now you know that the hands really have to stay alive and attentive to what's happening. Um, it's not so much that there's a laser beam in your dantian and it points and moves your hands. It's that there's a, it's rooted in the feet, released through the legs, directed by the waist, takes shape in the hands. There's this motion that's always running through you. Even as you're still on the outside, there's things changing on the inside. So it doesn't mean that you have to be turning all the time to make your hands go. The little movements are also connected through the Dantian. So use this idea to explore um, what this means on a deeper level. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>